Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day. We were kind of looking for a dad joke and uh, ripping through the phone a minute ago, and we came up with this, this one. Um, my son said that he should get half of all of my Father's Day gifts because he said if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> so there you go. Dad joke of the day. Um, today we are starting a new sermon series, um, and we're calling this one Wise. And um, really this is, is not so much a new sermon series, but a, a, it's a continuation of our sermon series that we've looked at that started really back in November when we, um, when we started taking a closer look at the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember that? We have had four other sermon series that are covering the Sermon on the Mount. We began with one called Hashtag Blessed, where we looked at the blessings from God and that we noted that we are becoming citizens of the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus is calling us to this radically countercultural movement to become kingdom citizens, not of this world, but of the kingdom of God. And we learned that all we come to this deal with is our spiritual poverty. And that these first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount act as sort of a preamble to the constitution for this new kingdom. Then we learned that we live and we exist in a very messy world. A world that says that we should strive to get even. We hear slogans like, revenge is a dish best served cold. Or, I don't get mad, I get even. We learn from our world that we are justified in our hatred for other people. And that what goes, on, what goes for the kingdom of the world um, is all of that, right? But not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there is love instead of anger. It's forgiveness instead of revenge. It's peace instead of hatred. And we spent the first part of this year learning about how we communicate in this kingdom of God. We learned how to talk to Jesus, right? Right? And then we had this series on whom or in what we put our trust. Do you put your trust in your treasures, in your wealth, or do we trust Jesus? And over all of this, we were asking this question, what do you want out of life? What do you really want out of this life? And we noted that if you want God in your life, if you want Jesus in your life, then you need to get this stuff down. Pattering our lives after Jesus will accomplish this goal. And so now we've gone through pretty much the entire Sermon on the Mount, and we're coming now to the end of that sermon and the end of this section of Jesus' teaching with this series that we're calling Wise. And we're calling it Wise because that's where this section of the sermon is taking us. It's driving us towards that. That's really where this chapter is going to end and this entire sermon is going. We're going to be highlighting this story in a couple of weeks about a wise person and a foolish person. One builds their house on a rock and the other builds their house on the sand and a hurricane comes and only one of the houses is left standing. And so the question of this entire series that we are going to ask each person is, which person are you? Are you wise or unwise? But that's a story for a few weeks down the road. And before, Jesus is going to drop some wisdom on us right today. So let's get into that right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today seeking wisdom. Help us, Lord, to listen to your word, to learn the lessons from Jesus, our Savior. Lord, let us learn how to be wise in our dealings with others in the area of judging and discerning. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. Well, I want to talk about an eye surgery. You see, the, an ophthalmologist regularly has to perform eye surgeries as part of his practice. And do you know that the smallest and most delicate procedure that an ophthalmologist has to perform, do you know what that is? It is the eye stent inject implant. We, there we go. If you notice the penny next to Abraham Lincoln's nose, there's a little dot right above the date. That is actually the eye stent. It's the actual size. An eye stent is implanted into the 
trabecular meshwork, I had to look that up, which is the drainage system of the eye in patients who have glaucoma. The eye stent is the smallest implant that can be put into a person's body. Now, in order to carefully perform this operation, the surgeon usually looks through um, like a microscope and has visual magnification at 10 to the 12th time normal vision. And as you can probably imagine, it requires incredibly steady hands and the breath control of a marksman. Now, in today's passage, Christ makes an important analogy between judging one another's spiritual condition and performing a delicate procedure on another person's eye. And from these analogies, Jesus will drop some wisdom on us. So let's get into our text, okay? Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them. They will be on the screen. Let's stand for the reading of Scripture, please. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, hey, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Word of the Lord. Praise be God. You may be seated. Wow. There is some really difficult things in this teaching from Jesus on this topic of judging others. Throughout this passage, it is important to note what Jesus does not want us to do and what Jesus does want us to do, right? So let's spend a little time going through the passage a little bit at a time so that we don't miss the wisdom that Jesus is dropping on us today. So we start with something that Jesus does not want us to do. Do not judge others, he says. Some translations say judge not. I also really like the message which says don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, You know, this idea of never judging another person is arguably the most difficult thing in the world to accomplish. I mean, I know it's hard for me. Because somewhere deep down in the parts of myself that I don't like to look at, I'm a judgmental person. To some extent, we all are. Otherwise, why would Jesus even be talking about this in the Sermon on the Mount if this did not apply to all of us, right? Do not judge others is really one of the hardest things to abstain from. Let me, let me phrase it another way to illustrate the point. Judging another person is one of the easiest things in the world to do. This is because we are all self-righteous, right? And we automatically tend to see the faults in others, but, you know, not in ourselves. So the whole wise teaching here is this. From the New Revised Standard, it says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure that you get. So do not judge others so that you will be not judged yourself. He then restates this in a different way when he says, for the judgment that you pronounce is the judgment you will get, and the measure that you give will be the measure that you get. This is a Hebrew teaching device called parallelism. And this is the first century version of you know what goes around comes around so what jesus what is jesus saying when he says do not judge well let me tell you what he's not saying okay he is not saying that we should turn off our mind he is not saying that we should suspend our critical thinking uh, powers he's not saying turn a blind eye to what's going on around you he is not saying that we should stop discerning between truth and error or between good and evil so how, how can we be sure that Jesus didn't mean those things? Well, partially because it would not be honest to behave like that, but hypocritical. And we know from this passages and other passages like it of Jesus' love for integrity and his hatred for hypocrisy. 
but also partially because God created us and each of us this ability to make value judgments. In fact, the entire Sermon on the Mount is a call for us to use critical thinking capabilities to be here in this world, but, but not of this world, to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> while we're in this world. So when we come to him in this poverty of spirit, when we mourn the wrongs that we have caused, when we humble ourselves before God, Matthew 5 says that we will be given a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And then that manifests itself in the mercy that we show others, in, in the purity of our hearts, and in the peace we go about trying to make. See, value judgments and critical thinking are required for all of that. So is changing our views about anger. You shall not murder becomes, do not become angry with somebody for you may be committing murder in your hearts. So what is he saying? If we define judging as being unwanted, unjustified criticism, then what Jesus is saying is that we should not do this. Judgment is criticism that is neither, that is either unfair or unjust. This is what John Stott says about this. He says, Jesus is prohibiting us from being censorious. He is saying being censorious is a compound sin consisting of several unpleasant ingredients. It does not mean to assess people critically, but to judge them harshly. A censorious critic is a fault finder who is negative and destructive towards people and enjoys actively seeking out their failings. Such a person puts the worst possible construction of their motives on others, pours cold water on their schemes, and is ungenerous towards their mistakes. You know, when we do this, we set up ourselves up as a censor, and we claim competence and authority to sit in judgment over our fellow human beings. That, frankly, is God's role, not ours. We should not damn other people. We're not called to be some kind of self-prescribed, self-appointed divine court pronouncing judgment on someone else's position with God. We don't condemn people. A pastor I, I knew once said that he didn't know how a Democrat could also be a Christian. And I immediately jumped on him on that. And I challenged this, having known in my life many, many good Bible-believing Christians who happen to be part of the Democratic Party. But the point is that we're not called to condemn someone because of their political party or what they say or what they do, because whatever measuring stick that we're using on them, Jesus says here, is going to be used on us. So it's not our job to judge a person's eternal soul, because we do not know the eternal disposition of a person's soul. We cannot possibly know another person's true standing before God. That's his job his realm. He's the king. He is God. We are not. So then Jesus drives home this point with an incredibly stark and poignant teaching. I open the sermon today with this illustration of an incredible eye surgery. Imagine the precision that we require to place that tiny little implant into somebody's eye to help them see to alleviate that pressure and help them see more clearly. And Jesus gives us an example that is both absurd and makes sense at the same time. Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, Jesus says, let me help you get, that, get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past this log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. This is all about our seemingly endless ability to find fault in others while being blind to it in our own lives. Right? On top of this, we tend to point out the things in other people's lives that are the very things that we are struggling with. Which is why Jesus uses this crazy illustration. We like to find faults in others because we're doing the very same thing. So on some base level, we must rationalize, well, sure, I've got problems, but at least I'm not like that guy. You know, in fact, Jesus tells a story about this, right? At one point in his ministry, he contrasts the prayer of a Pharisee 
to that of a tax collector. The Pharisee points out his righteous behavior. He says this, I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm not certainly like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week and give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven. He prayed instead and he beat his chest in sorrow. And he said, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. This sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the very story. This story is at the very heart of the teaching today from our text in Matthew 7 about seeing the speck in our brother's eye because we're blinded by this log in our own eye. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about this very thing in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Bonhoeffer says this, the source of our righteousness comes only through our connection, our fellowship with Jesus Christ. Through that connection, our righteousness is possessed only in that association with Jesus, never outside of it. That is why our righteousness can never become an objective criterion to be applied at will to others. We're not disciples of Jesus because we possess some kind of new standard of living, but only because Jesus, the mediator, the Son of God, draws us to himself. Once we come into fellowship with Jesus Christ, Bonhoeffer says, we cannot, as we could at one time, be a detached observer of ourselves and judge ourselves, for we can only see Jesus and be seen by him and judged by him and, and reprieved by him. It is not an approved standard of righteousness that separates the follower of Christ from the unbeliever, but it is Christ who stands between them. Then he says this. When we judge other people, we confront them in a spirit of detachment, observing and reflecting, as it were, from the outside, but love has neither the time nor the opportunity for this. If we love, we can never observe people with detachment, for they are always and at every moment a living claim to our love and service. And then he closes his comments with this statement, which is up on the screen. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. So long as that log is in our eye, our sin issue, our fault, it blinds us from being able to see clearly what's going on in someone else's life. Therefore, we are called to love and grace. My friend Tim says of this passage that when we point things out in other people, he says, things are never as bad in other people as you think they are, and things are never as good in yourself as you think they are. He says we suffer from a disease called a self-favoring bias. We downplay our own faults and we overplay the faults of others. We cut ourselves so much slack. We're hard on others and easy on ourselves. Our vision is 20-20 when it involves somebody else and we are completely blind as bats when it comes to ourselves. This is a problem for us both individually and as a church. So what do we do? I recommend that, we've, that we feel led by God, when we feel led by God to help you know, someone else by pointing out their shortcomings, that we should use the following discernment filter using this acrostic, need. The N in need is necessary. We ask ourselves, is what we're about to point out in someone else's life truly necessary to say? The first E is encourage. Will this uplift their heart, energize? Will this empower their spirit? And the D is for dignify. Will it increase their self-esteem? If you miss the mark on any of that acrostic, you should just keep this to yourself. So we would do well to use this discernment filter every time we feel the need, you know, to point out someone else's fault, you know, for their own good. That same filter should be used by the church when we do this as others as well. 
You know, if you don't like criticism, then don't criticize people, right? All of our conversations really should have a twofold purpose. Avoid criticism and speak blessings. Avoid criticizing and speak blessings. Paul says this in Colossians 4, verse 6. He says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. The solution that Jesus gives for us being blind in our judgment of others is to simply deal with ourselves first. Remove the log from your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to help somebody else, your brother or sister, and remove the speck from their eye. The moral here is doing the requisite personal soul care will give you clear vision to be able to employ that need discernment filter. So Jesus then turns from talking about this prohibition to judging others, and he moves on talking about, from talking about this first century eye surgery, and then he tells us to make a judgment, right? Which brings us to verse 6. I want to read this verse from the English Standard Version. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. You know, at first glance, it seems almost as if this verse doesn't really go with the preceding five verses, but it does in such a remarkable way. I mean, at first sight and hearing, this is startling language from the lips of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, and indeed immediately right after he's been asking us to appeal and making his appeal for constructive behavior. But Jesus rarely minces his words. This is the same man who called Herod Antipas that fox. And he called the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees whitewashed tombs and a brood of vipers. And he affirms here that certain human beings act like animals and may therefore be accurately described as dogs and pigs. So Jesus here is asking us to judge somebody as a dog or a pig, which seems kind of incongruous, right? Do not judge, and now he's telling us to make a judgment. But there's an incredible balance here, a really healthy balance in this teaching. If we are not to judge others, finding fault with them in a censorious, condemning, or hypocritical way, we are also not to ignore their faults and, and, and pretend that everybody's fine. Both extremes are to be avoided. First, we're to remove the plank from our own eye. Then we can see clear to take the speck out of our brother or sister's eye. And if they are truly a believer in Jesus Christ they will appreciate the help. But not everybody is grateful for criticism and correction, are they? According to the book of Proverbs, this is one of, one of the obvious distinctions between a wise person and a fool, right? It says uh, in Proverbs 9, 8, do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. The fools described in Proverbs are now being described by Jesus as dogs and pigs. So who are these people that Jesus is referring to? First, you need to understand that the dogs that Jesus has in mind here are not well-behaved, pretty pet dogs from elegant homes. These are the mangy mongrels that are, that are scavenging the city dumps. And the, and the pigs were unclean animals to the Jewish people, not to mention their love for mud. And, so, and the apostle Peter, he describes a dog that returns to its own vomit. And then he says there was a sow that is washed, returns to her wallowing in mud. So what is Jesus talking about here? You know, Jesus is a realist. He is saying here that there are people out there who will not receive the truth. They will not receive the truth that you have to offer, no matter how kind, no matter how loving, no matter how humble you are in the delivery. And he calls these people these extreme names here. He calls them dogs and pigs. As we've noted, the, these are not the cute little puppies and piglets. These are people who are vicious, and they have an inability to hear. They have a disregard and a disrespect for truth, a contempt for the truth. They're violent at times in their response. They will shout you down and maybe even worse. Now Jesus is referring to a select group of people that is outside the church, but sometimes these people, they wind up in the church, don't they? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we all possess a little bit of this character within ourselves. Jesus died at the hand of people like this. 
church people, religious people. Jesus is saying to us this morning that you need to be wise. Don't waste your time. Don't be naive. Don't just keep throwing things out there to such people. You want to steer clear. You want to, you want to establish some healthy boundaries with these kind of people. Now, now, there's a way to identify the pigs and the dogs, as it were. Now, let's not call them that ourselves, but when we think that we may have encountered somebody like this, here is a way that you can find out for sure. A friend of mine, he calls this the snort test. The snort test. The way the snort test works is when you say something to one of these people, you ask them a question, you share a pearl with them, share with them something of value or something from your own life, or talk to them maybe about an uncomfortable topic. If the response that you get from them is a snort, kind of a or a roll of the eyes, or dismissive or sarcastic comment or some kind of aggressive reaction, if that's what you get when you put out your pearl there, um, then you've just learned that this is a person you need to be careful with, a person you need to be careful with your pearls or your treasures, keep a distance. Maybe this person is at your work or at your school or, or when you're just out and about going about. Maybe this person's in your family. Don't cast your pearls before those who cannot receive it. Those people may take it and stomp it into the ground and then come after you. Be wise about that. Continue to talk to people about what's going on in your life. Continue to share the gospel with people. We do that here at Lighthouse. Continue to shine the light of Christ in our community. But when you encounter a pig or a dog, Jesus is calling us to be wise. To be wise about the people who are not safe to share these things with. Now, sometimes you have to take a stand. Sometimes you have to stand up and speak out, and that takes courage, especially if it involves somebody who's not very nice, right? Right now, we are living in a verbally vicious, verbally violent time in our country. Speaking up and speaking out and opening your mouth in today's society is risky. Many are waiting and ready to jump on what you're saying if something is, you know, not correct or not acceptable, that doesn't fit within somebody else's ideology or their version of the world or their version of whatever today's groupthink is and is promoting. And this, by the way, happens on both sides of the political aisle. They're both guilty of the same kind of behavior. We see this kind of thing when we talk to people about race, when we talk to people about vaccines, about clean energy, about about guns, right? Pick any topic from the news today and there will be people on both sides of the issue ready to pounce upon you. There are people out there who are quick to call you racist and see racism as the root cause for all of social problems. And there are pe people out there quick to deny that America has no, no problem with race at all. People have commented to me that I talk about this subject a lot to the extent that they feel like I'm I'm, I'm, I'm calling you out on race, I'm being racist, but I'm not. I'm pointing out that this is an issue that our country is going through and that we have gone through in our history over and over and over and that our history seems to be repeating itself. And that the love of Jesus transcends these differences in the colors of our skin, transcends the differences of where we come from, transcends our culture. I remember being on a mission trip to the Philippines one time back in the 80s, in the height of the Cold War, when the Soviets were our enemies. But somehow, four pastors and missionaries from, from Russia smuggled their way to the Philippines to attend this global missions conference. These men were risking their very lives for the gospel of Jesus. Now, I could have viewed them as my enemy, because at the time, they were America's enemy. Or I could view them as brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, the light of Christ transcends race. It transcends political party. It transcends economic status, transcends hatred, transcends heated discussions on sexuality, on gender, transcends abortion rights, gun control, you name it. Jesus is beyond all of that. But when we talk about these controversial topics, often it brings judgmental attitudes. There are judgmental attitudes in each of us that probably need to be repented of.
in some of the people who make the most noise and who shout the loudest about these things are some of the people who need to pick up a mirror and take a good long look at themselves. These are maybe the ones who need to remove the logs from their own eyes because they can't see clearly, but you and I are not to make that call. What you and I are to do is to deal with our own sin, our own face in the mirror, our own plank in our eye. We start here. Then we can be ready in a spirit of humility to begin naming what we see around us, to be able to point something out in another person's life. There's a phrase, hate the sin, love the sinner. Have you heard that, hate the sin, love the sinner? I think Jesus would turn that around a little bit. To love the sinner, hate your own sin. Love the sinner, hate your own sin. Start there. Do not judge people. Do not condemn people. That's, that's not stepping away from recognizing truth or what is right or wrong. I mean, we teach that to our children all the time, don't we? But Jesus is saying that we're to start with our own sins. We're to take care of the, our own logs and our own eyes. Remove the plank from our own eyes. Start with the man or the woman in the mirror. One pastor pointed out a very important aspect to all of this. When Jesus says, do not judge, do not condemn, it's important that we remember that we do not judge or condemn ourselves either. Repent of the sinful attitudes, but do not condemn yourself because someone has already paid the price for your condemnation. Jesus did that. Jesus, our Savior, went to the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. He did what we could not do. Judgment blinds us. Love illuminates. Amen? Think about the woman who was caught in adultery in the Bible. They brought her before Jesus. They brought, him, brought her to him for him to judge her and pronounce judgment and condemnation upon her. Remember that story from the Bible? The scribes and the Pharisees, they brought this woman who was a lawbreaker. They wanted Jesus as a rabbi to pronounce judgment. They, were, they had put this up as a test to see if he was from their tribe, right? They were ready to execute her by stoning her to death. But Jesus was wise before these dogs and pigs. He looked at them and he said this, He who is without sin casts the first stone. The Bible says they didn't have an answer for that. One by one, starting with the oldest, they dropped their rocks and they went home. So that Jesus was left with, alone with this woman, with this sinner. And what does Jesus say to her? He stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. The only person in that story who met Jesus' condition for condemnation was Jesus. He was the only one without sin, but in, instead of judgment, he loves her. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the same thing our Savior has done for you and I. He loves the sinner. He loves the sinner. He loves us, does not condemn us, neither should we. I want to leave you with a spiritual practice for the week. Ask God to show you the logs in your own lives. Every time you find yourself with a judgmental, censorious, condemning thoughts about somebody else, ask God to show you the log in your own eye. And then pray the prayer of repentance. There are three parts to this prayer for you this week. The first is to ask this question. Lord, whom have I judged this week? Number two, show me my own sin in that area. Number three, say you're sorry and resolve to remove that sin from your life. Ask God, whom have I judged? Show me my own sin. Say I'm sorry that's the prayer of repentance. Do this every single day. Make this a part of your daily walk. Maybe pray this right before you go to bed each night. Make this your spiritual practice for the week. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us today. We pray, Lord, that we could hear this and truly become wise. Help us to remember when we feel like judging somebody else, or we have a judgmental thought, or we have some deep need to point out the fault in somebody else, for us to just stop. Make sure, Lord, we don't have any plank in our own eye that needs to be removed before we get on with that need to point out somebody else's faults. Help us, Lord, employ this discernment filter need. Is it necessary? Is it encouraging? Is it energizing? Does it dignify the person? If it doesn't do those things, Lord, give us the integrity and the love to shut it down. And every time, Lord, that we have a judgmental thought, Lord, we pray that you would help us to just focus on ourselves. Show us those logs in our own eyes, those sins that we need to deal with. Lord, help us to key in on the truth that judgment makes us blind, but love is illuminating. It shines a light on all the darkness in our lives. And that is what we are here at Lighthouse to do, to shine Christ's light in our community, even if that means starting with our own hearts. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.